I'd like to apologize for blue balling you all a few weeks ago when I built this system. I knew going in that putting it together with the new Intel i9-10900K and a Zotac RTX 2080 Ti Amp Extreme, but then dipping out without testing it for everybody would be slightly controversial. However, at the time, I simply wasn't yet allowed to give you any performance metrics. Well, the curtain has now lifted and the results are in. The 10900K does indeed once again give Intel license to say that they have the world's fastest gaming CPU. But I think here at BPS Customs, we can go faster and I'm gonna show you how. Last year's award-winning PureBase 500 is back with more style, better airflow, and more features. Meet the latest stellar offering from Be Quiet, the PureBase 500 DX. Dressed in black or white, the DX introduces improved airflow through the complete mesh front panel and an eye-catching addressable RGB accent. It retains the same functional yet compact interior layout with room for up to a 360 millimeter radiator, and it does this all for under 100 bucks. To learn more, head over to BeQuiet.com or check the link below. So four weeks ago, I built this, the world's fastest gaming PC. While I'm sure I'll get many, um, actually, comments, the truth is that we're using the fastest CPU for gaming in the 10900K and the fastest mainstream GPU for gaming, the RTX 2080 Ti. Sure, the Titan RTX is just slightly quicker, but it's twice the price and targeted at AI applications. And I guess if you started including and in talking about SLI, then uh, that's a different ball game. But for basically 99% of people out there, this is as good as it gets. So in order to test out our version of the world's fastest gaming PC, I built myself a little gaming desk setup to lay down some baseline numbers. Steve from Gamers Nexus sent me over one of their new wireframe desk mats to try out. And I have to say, as soon as I unrolled it, I felt the sudden urge to publish a 28 minute deep dive into anti-static bags or something. Do they really work? or has big ESD just been hoodwinking us all this entire time? I hooked up some Corsair peripherals and then had to make a decision. What resolution would I game at? A 2080 Ti can certainly push enough frames at 4K, but I think that high refresh rate 1440p experiences are just so much better. So this is AOC's CQ27G2 monitor. It uses a 1440p 144Hz VA panel with one millisecond response time and FreeSync Premium to deliver a fantastic gaming experience. The construction and bezel is minimal and unintrusive. The only small accent is the red flare at the bottom of the housing and the entire unit is actually much smaller than I thought it would be even with the power supply built into the cabinet. A lot of high refresh rate monitors have either larger bezels or thicker construction, but I guess AOC seems to have gotten it right. They also have included an excellent stand with pivot, swivel, tilt, and height adjustments. This is the kind of monitor that I would want to game on with a card as powerful as a 2080 Ti. The first thing that we wanna do before starting any overclocking is to lay down a baseline. I wanted one dedicated CPU test with consistent results to go along with our gaming title, so of course that's gonna be Cinebench R20. This will allow us to get a good handle on the thermal performance of our build and any headroom that we have. I ran Cinebench at all stock CPU settings and the memory at 3466 and ended up with a score of 6295. During the test, all 10 of our CPU cores were pegged at 4.9 gigahertz and CPU package temps maxed out at 67C. Now, if we were to loop that test, the temperature would probably continue to creep up until the liquid in our NZXT Kraken Z73 reached heat saturation, but at least this does give us something to compare to. Next, I ran the CAN benchmark for two games using different APIs. For DX11, I chose Far Cry New Dawn. The result here was an average of 116 FPS and incredibly smooth frame times. GPU utilization also during this test was not at 100%, meaning that likely we can increase our gaming performance by overclocking our CPU. For DX12, I went with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and just like with Far Cry, the test was run at 1440p and max settings. No DLSS or HDR settings were used for either game. The result here was remarkably close to the Far Cry numbers with an average FPS of 119. Even though this video isn't going to be a tutorial on how to OC your graphics card, 
I felt that since our mission today is to make this PC as fast as it can be, a quick and dirty overclock on our 2080 Ti was in order. I fired up Unigine Heaven and started looping it in the background to create a load on the GPU, and then used MSI Afterburner to make my changes. The first thing to do is unlock voltage control in the settings and change the fan control from auto to user defined. After that, I cranked up the power and temperature sliders to allow the GPU to draw more wattage if needed. At this point, it became a game of trial and error as you can start stepping up your core and memory clocks until you experience instability. Unfortunately, even after settling at plus 115 on the core and plus 1050 on the memory, which ran just fine in Unigen Heaven, I had to back off to plus 85 megahertz core and plus 1000 megahertz memory in order to get Far Cry and Tomb Raider to complete. At this point, I re-ran our gaming benchmarks to see what kind of performance benefit just overclocking the GPU gave us. Far Cry New Dawn just ticked up slightly from 116 FPS to 118, indicating that the game is likely CPU bound at this point. Shadow of the Tomb Raider though gave us a significant bump up to 128 FPS from 119. But now comes the point in the video that you all probably fast forwarded to, let's overclock our 10900K. I'm going to give you the steps that I used here, but keep in mind that your process and results will definitely vary depending on the motherboard that you have and your particular CPU. Some 10900Ks will overclock better than others, and unfortunately mine is not one of them. In fact, it's kind of a dud, and you'll see why in a second. My overclock was done on an Asus Strix Z490 eGaming motherboard, so especially if you're using another brand like Gigabyte or MSI, your BIOS will look very different. Hopefully, however, there will be similar toggles and adjustments. They'll just probably be in a different place. Also, this will be a fairly basic tutorial. There are a lot more BIOS settings that we can change or tweak, but this should get you up and running. For LGA 1200, there are some important new things to keep in mind when diving in. Intel has implemented several new features that will need to be adjusted when we are overclocking a 10 series processor. And although it's still relatively straightforward, this isn't as easy as just changing your multiplier and bumping voltage. Start with your motherboard's multi-core enhancement setting in the AI tweaker menu in our case. This is a setting that I used to disable on older platforms as it can apply changes to your manual overclocks. However, here you need to change it from auto to enable. If you disable this, Intel's default settings can override your overclocks. I found this out the hard way when I got very frustrated with my first few overclocks not working at all until I changed this setting. Step two as we move down the list is AVX instruction. This setting tells the CPU to downclock when running AVX instruction sets as they tend to be very stressful and generate a lot of heat. The higher the number here, the more your CPU will downclock with one, two, three, corresponding to 100, 200, and 300 megahertz. I changed mine to zero, but you don't necessarily need to be this aggressive if you don't want to. The lower that you set this number, the more potential instability that you introduce as soon as you run any AVX tasks. Up next is what everybody thinks of when they talk about CPU overclocking, and that's CPU core ratio. This is the multiplier that acts on the base clock. Change this option to sync all cores and then start ticking up. For the 10900K, I'd start at 50, which would translate to five gigahertz and then go up from there. A good rule of thumb is that you should target an all core overclock somewhere in the neighborhood of what the CPU's single core listed turbo can achieve at stock settings. So for the 10900K, the single core turbo is 5.2 or 5.3 gigahertz, depending on conditions. And in fact, most 10900Ks can achieve these speeds on all cores with the right adjustments. I settled at a multiplier of 52 or 5.2 gigahertz. When I tune my CPUs, I also like to make sure that my voltages are constant. If you don't change the adaptive voltage setting, your motherboard will determine what voltage it thinks is correct for any given situation. Meaning that under idle conditions, your CPU will effectively be undervolted versus what your overclock needs to function. Changing this from enable to disable will provide a constant voltage 
to your CPU, increasing your overclock's stability. So speaking of that CPU voltage, that's the next thing to tune. And this is highly dependent on the quality of your silicon. You will need to change this from auto to manual and then increase it. The question is just how much you will need to increase it. For some chips and some overclocks, you might be able to get away with as low as say 1.25 volts. For the majority of 10900Ks out there, I think it's reasonable to be in the 1.3 to 1.4 range. Start as low as you can and work your way up in small steps until you reach stability. My chip is a dud. I wasn't able to get stable at anything less than 1.42 volts, which is higher than I would want for a 24-7 overclock. And this was only at 5.2 gigahertz, but this did allow me to complete all of my tests and to loop Cinebench for over an hour without any issues. DRAM voltage is something that you might not need to play with, but if you're running a particularly fast kit, or if you want to play around with memory overclocking, just keep in mind that DRAM is a lot more tolerant of higher voltages than CPUs are. A voltage here of 1.5 might look dangerous, but it's perfectly fine. And the last thing to change is your long duration power limit. Input a number here like 5,000, which will default to the highest possible setting. This will allow more power to be fed to the CPU for longer periods of time. Unfortunately, my capture took a crap and I didn't get to show this to you. Sorry about that. So now that our 10900K has been tuned up, what kind of improvements do we get? Well, Cinebench shows all cores stuck at 5.2 gigahertz as we dialed in, and the result is 6651, or about a 400 point bump from stock. I also ran our games with Far Cry giving us another two FPS up to 120 versus 116 stock and 118 with just the GPU OC. Similarly, Shadow of the Tomb Raider creeped up to 130 FPS, not a huge increase, but a measurable one. You'll see different variations in games depending on title. In the end though, this is just a blast of a gaming machine. I fired up some Doom Eternal to capture some gameplay footage for B-roll and I ended up playing through an entire level. Everything just operates so smoothly and the experience on a high refresh rate monitor is absolutely top notch, especially when G-Sync takes over. So hopefully this brief tutorial helps you get your 10900K or other 10th gen processor up and running to its full potential but make sure that you do have the right cooling in place when you do. Temps went from 67 to 79C on our test system, and I'm using a 360 millimeter radiator inside of a case. So this is a real world scenario, and you can expect to see maybe similar results. There's no open air bench used here. So will you guys be overclocking your 10 series CPU? Let me know down below in the comments. Also don't forget to get subscribed, hit the notification bell, and leave a like if you found this video useful. Thanks for watching as always, and I will see you next time.